Hello again. I'd like to talk a little bit now about radius of gyration. And radius of gyration is one of these things that's often confusing to uh, engineering students and technology students. It turns out it's not that hard. There's only a couple basic ideas you have to absorb and then you're good to go. Now the problem with radius of gyration is it shows up in two places. It shows up in strength of materials and dynamics. And although the name is the same, the expressions are different and they mean different things. Now the reason is that when mathematicians see the same expression enough times, dropping out of their equations, they give it a name. And this is one of those cases. They named this expression radius of gyration. So for strength of materials, the radius of gyration is written out as the square root of i over a, where that's length to the fourth over length squared for the units. The square root of that gives you length, so it would be a radius. This is the area moment of inertia, and this is the area of some object. In almost all cases, we're looking at buckling, so this is the area of a column. In dynamics, radius of gyration looks almost the same, but it means something different. In mechanics, this is the mass moment of inertia, and this is the mass of a rotating object. So let's say I had a cylinder like that, and it was rotating about some axis. Okay, it's spinning. And the mass of the cylinder is m, and I could figure out some mass moment of inertia i. Well, if I wanted to take all the mass of that cylinder and concentrate it in one place, but still have the same mass moment of inertia, I would do this, make that same axis about which the, the object spins, concentrate all the mass right there at a point, that's the radius of gyration. This spinning mass spinning about that axis and this spinning mass spinning about that axis have the same mass moment of inertia. So this is nice and physical. This is, this is easy to describe in physical, graphical terms. We're interested in strength of materials, not dynamics. So I'm going to stop with that and go back over to here. Now the problem with radius of gyration over here is that it doesn't have a nice, clean, physical definition. It's certainly something you can figure out, but it doesn't have this intuitive, mechanical uh, uh, definition like we saw over here for dynamics. For strength of materials, we're mostly interested in buckling problems. So let's say I've got a pin-ended column. I'm drawing this pretty fast here. Okay, column is pinned on both ends. Okay, I guess you can't really see that. Let me do this. There you go, pinned on both ends. And there's a force here, and I'll call that force F. If that force is big enough, this column is going to buckle. Now, there's two kinds of buckling. There's long column and short column buckling. Here's a long, thin column. When I will push that, I can make it buckle. Now, there's no plastic deformation. When I stop pushing, it comes back to its original shape. Okay? And the axis of the column has changed. In fact, the center of the centroid, I guess, the, the line of this beam, has deformed quite a lot. Here's short column buckling. A while back, some of my students decided they wanted to experiment with short column buckling. They got an entire case of soup, 24 cans, and ate all 24 cans of soup, I assume over the course of a week or two. I don't think they did it in a day. And they started crunching these, compressing these, until they finally got them to uh, compress without deforming this way, they come crunching straight down. And what they got, I'll, I'll hold this up so you can see it, is perfect, and I mean just perfect like you read about, short column buckling. That's what it looks like. And you get this nice, you get this nice hexagonal star shape in there. Okay, in order to figure out whether the problem is going to give you short column buckling or long column buckling, you have to use the radius of gyration. Now this is a little bit convoluted, but it turns out it's not too hard. Let me give you some numbers here. This is Length is going to be 3 meters. Diameter is going to be 75 millimeters. This, I'm assuming this is a solid steel rod. Okay? The steel has a yield strength of 400 megapascals 
and elastic modulus of 205 gigapascals. And that's all we need to know. And we know it's got pinned ends. All right. The question we need to know now, whether we've got a long column or short column, we need to compare something called the slenderness ratio and the column constant. Let's see, that's usually... Okay. If the slenderness ratio is larger than the column constant, then I've got a long column. Okay. If not, I've got a short column. All right. Now, three meters long and 75 millimeters wide, it's, it's huge. It's, it wouldn't fit in this room, and it's only that wide, so pretty fair bet that this is a long column. But let's show that mathematically. The slenderness ratio, and I always have to remember this is KL over R. Yeah, KL over R. K, in this case, is 1. Okay, K is the end fixity condition. For pinned ends, K is 1. For other end conditions, K is something else. And the reason it's like that is because when Euler derived these equations originally, he derived it for pinned ends, and rather than rederiving the equation, thought it would be easier to just use the same expression with different Ks for different end conditions. So this is 1 times 3 meters R. Well, square root of I over A for this turns out to be 18.75 millimeters. And the uh, slenderness ratio is 160. Okay, That's unitless. Now just to back up here a second, I for this is pi, I'm sorry, pi over 64 d to the fourth, and for this case we get, uh, let's see, uh, 1.5532 times 10 to the sixth millimeters to the fourth, and A is pi over 4d squared, and that's 4.4179 times 10 to the third millimeters squared. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time here, i got about two and a half minutes left. So I'm going to run through this pretty fast, okay? But those, you can work these numbers out for yourself. They're pretty straightforward, okay? So we've got slenderness ratio is 160. Column constant is, let's see, 2 pi squared e sigma y square root. That's the column constant. Column constant is also unitless, and here it turns out to be 100.58. Right. So, because of that, we know that this is a long, slender column. We, we suspected that anyway, but we've now shown mathematically that it's true. So, we've proven that. Last thing we need to know is the buckling load. Well, the critical buckling load is pi squared e i over k squared l squared. Right? We already know that's 1. That's just a number. We know that. We know that. We know that we're good to go. All we have to do is plug numbers in there and generate a value. When you work this out, you get 3, 4, 9, 1, 6, 0. You know, it's actually 1, 6, 1, but I'm working to five significant figures. So there we go. Using the radius of gyration, we were able to calculate a slenderness ratio. We compared the slenderness ratio to the column constant to show that we had a long column. Knowing that we have a long column, we're able to use the Euler buckling equation and calculate the buckling load of this long, slender, pin-ended column.